few speakers um, back up onto the stage just for a short period of questions before we go to a break. Um, so with Sal and Katerina and Michelle, if you'd be willing to do that, that would be fantastic. A last set of papers. Um, I'm very happy just to kick off a, a conversation if that, if that isn't forthcoming. It's very hard to see actually if there's any. Is it possible to, to take the mics down slightly? From the projector maybe because, aha, hello everybody. <laughs> um, did anybody have a question that they wanted to pose? I might, I might just start actually, I wanted to um, ask you, Sal, something about the role of language in asserting the visual in terms of the film where the CGI had been used um, at the visual agnosia and how, um, how the, the language was accessed, how somebody came to describe their experience through the visual when they only have one experience of that visual in order to match it to our own. I'm just interested in how that was facilitated. Is that something you were a part of? Um, you, you, you mean uh, how did we have some insight into what Michael was seeing? Okay, um, yes, very good question. Um, I was really very privileged to be part of the diagnostic sessions. Ros McCarthy in invents um, diagnoses because if you ask somebody something so for example um, there's a condition called zoagnosia which uh, is um, you know you, you, you recognize that something's an animal but you don't know what animal it is so Ros invented animals that were a combination of two animals so you know an elephant uh, head and a, and, a, and a rabbit back because um, uh, you know because if somebody said you know, uh, oh, 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 I, uh, I know this, this, this animal eats uh, grass and lives in Scotland. You know that they have zoagnosia because you know, we all we want to pr pretend we don't have a problem of recognition. I spent quite a lot of time going to these sessions with Michael um, and it was completely heartbreaking uh, because I think there is a whole element of a, a visual aesthetics which he can't have. Um, and it's, uh, it's like visual noise. And so it was really about spending time with him, spending time with his father, um, who was his main carer, uh, and trying to get a feel for what his world must be like. And as Ros, the neuroscientist, said, actually in an email to me the other day, um, we don't have intersubjectivity. And you know how, and, I, and that's why we make films, really, and why film is such a wonderful medium to try and communicate. But I think there is something very, uh, almost distressing about what um, Michael experiences. And we used quite a lot of um, research into how uh, we think image is understood. But essentially, I think it's it's you know what he sees is distressing rather than anything else, uh, and I'm not sure that we can begin to convey it. Sorry, that's rather long. That's great, thank you. Susan, do we to pass you? Confidently, but I do know that um, these architectural structures keep playing out within the artists from around the 60s and 70s um, going into the 80s. And I guess my talk was trying to um, make a connection to the context of Brazil without having it define um, Brazil uh, that there was an extremely long period of violent military dictatorship. And I think that. In researching these artists, it, it seems that protective spaces were made, structures to enter, um, skins to uh, hold and inhabit, um, 
kind of a, a veil or a you know parangolis for uh, Elio Otisica, these moving capes. There's a there's a way in which the body is cloaked or given an additional skin. So um, that is definitely likened to an architectural structure or biological um, architecture. Uh, Isabella Lendi's work. Yes, very much so. Um, um, the, the list is actually you know once you start looking, you find quite some parallels. So yeah, without trying to kind of nail it onto Brazil, I do think that, that that's coming out of it during that time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm not sure of the filmmaker's name, but, and I'm not sure if you saw his film, but Notes on Blindness uh, was a great film uh, trying to give you a subjective view of the experience of blindness um, and the filmmaker was particularly interested in using virtual reality and different approaches so I was wondering if you could share some thoughts on that. Has anybody seen the film from our panel? I think that, um, hi, hi, thank you. Um, I think Zoe's question is so good though, because it says, you know, what, 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 what language was used to communicate it? So I think, you know, it's, it's the artist, isn't it? We, you know, as the artist, how do we uh, use whatever tool it is? Because yes, it, the implication is that, that the tool is outstanding, but uh, how, how are we using it to communicate an inner world that we, we, we don't understand or maybe don't share. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think it's a great question. But I don't know if someone, someone else maybe can answer it better. I suppose that, that virtual reality is an extension of what the moving image has been in its various form throughout. Um, of offering a means that is not relevant for is indexical um, recording of something, but actually for shifting the index into something that becomes much more ungraspable. And because of that, to uh, contain some effect. And that effect seems to be what our brains respond to. <coughs> because the mental pictures that we make and we make it uh, perhaps with some uh, uh, correlation to the cultural env environment in which we live, are very much imbued into effect because we respond to them effectively. Our phys physiology changes according to what happens in our brain. That's, I think that's quite an interesting question as well in terms of um, engaging with the experiential. I've been thinking about the distance between documentary and cinema in your presentation um, and how virtuality then engages with a singular vision again, doesn't it, in terms of how we might watch, not just what's being presented to us, but that we're withheld from a cinematic public view, so you have a singular experience. So is that it's on the top of my head. That I, I think that um, you know in each case whether it be film or, or even Clark with trying to really bring the material to the people, there's this kind of need to um, position a much more kind of tangible, graspable, visceral, experiential encounter with 
the thing that we look at rather than this kind of observational mode. We we try to um, actually use something like a device of virtual reality where you try deeply to place um, the position of the viewer into, you know, throwing them into the scene. So, um, and I think that the original meanings for something like empathy, which might be one of the triggers of a, a kind of virtual reality device, was actually to talk about that as a bodily affect, that it was not just a kind of, I feel for you in a kind of emotional sense, it was really to physically position yourself within. Um, so I think that there's this desire across forms of documentary and performing of therapeutic encounters that ask for this plunge of the senses. And, um, and I think that's also relevant if anyone undergoes any form of analysis, that you're thrown into a space that is indeed to be experienced in a spatial sense um, and not just a kind of cerebral sense. So I think that that, that seems to you know, echo across the different forms. question is for Michelle, and it's kind of related to what you guys are talking about. And I was interested in um, the decision that you and Julia made to uh, bring the Clark piece or performance or experience into the classroom. And so I kind of, I was, I'm interested in this kind of transformation that happens if you look at Clark's work and performative art practice then she's in analysis, and then she kind of brings analysis into her art practice, and then you guys are bringing it into the classroom. And so it's related to the question of space and experience. So I was hoping that you, I know Julia is sitting here now, isn't she, uh, would just tell us a little bit about the decision to do that. important to um, constantly when you read anything on Clark there's an absolute need to feel it smell it you know taste it and um, whenever speaking about it because she's become so important to both our practices um, in the kind of privileged position of being able to have conversations with students um, to share just an aspect of that means that um, you've got to bring her into the, the classroom, as it were. And, you know, I'm really quite cur curious at, about the performing qualities of Clark and even the, you know, the potential spillover that the corpo collective or the collective body might even be cultish. I find that whole thing really interesting and that we could temporarily dip into that methodology is so interesting and you know long term I wouldn't mind setting up long term corpo collectivo is where we keep thinking about material because the thing that she's talking about isn't just about neat articulation it's about kind of physical awareness with objects and we sort of lose that so I think she is vital in, in kind of being um, connected to your body and, and the world. So we're going to go into, can we go for one more question, Wendy? I can see yes. one. Did you want to ask your yes. question? Okay. Just uh, also, well, first, thank you. This is an amazing uh, symposium with um, different, different people coming from different backgrounds and areas. And I'm really glad to be here. Um, the, the question is about, uh, for example, it comes from Florence's performance that introduced an element in the middle of this symposium that I have a dance background, but I'm, I'm bringing this beyond that. It's, it's not a dance question, it's, it's more broad. So, and I hope more simple also. <laughs> the idea of vibration that 
when she started the performance, um, started with high intensity and performative. And then we were invited into the stage for a lower intensity, low intensity, participative and more intimate experience. And the question of time, duration, uh, speed has been addressed by different uh, uh, people in the panel today. Uh, and affect. So this connection between patterns and, uh, and maybe I'm mixing a lot of stuff because sometimes I lost myself, but the question is what is for you uh, the, the, in terms of <laughs> perception of, of uh, mm, perception of, of difference in terms of how we perceive different realities and mental disorders also come from different experiences of intensities, of space, of time, of visual framing. So how, how does speed and rhythm and intensities for you is a, a, an important factor to, to your researches? So maybe this is a broad question, but the simple thing is that how, how fundamental it is to be aware of changes of speed, intensities, uh, mostly. Thank you. It is important, I think, it's, it's vital, I mean, most of my making tends to be screen-based, sadly, and the moments in which, particularly when I work with Julia Koneski, who's here today, um, the physicalised, tactile um, qualities of, of working with materials, for example, like the documentation from the gallery, brings about a completely different condition of being that's um, so different to a kind of um, mediated relationship with a screen. So essentially being a performer within your own work and physically articulating that is um, a huge, huge um, thing. And it, and it is slow, if it, it, it can be slow and I think um, that seems vital. So um, I don't I don't do it enough, but I when I do do it, I feel the difference, and I think that um, it's a kind of reminder each time to touch materials versus uh, to edit constantly or to you know to type or so. So it really seems crucial for me as a as an artist. Yeah. Uh, I suppose. Um, I don't know if you saw this, like it really is the fact that the states that we are talking about are all experienced as something that happens and they are highly disturbing. And I think that um, the film you showed about hallucinations had this really remarkable sort of feeling of being completely immersed in that situation. I don't really have anything to add, but of course as a filmmaker, time is so crucial um, in, 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 in so many art forms, but thank you for the question. Um, because I'm going to be on a panel as a practitioner after, but I just wanted to say something in terms of curatorially how that um, is really important. It, I think there's something in everything that we've seen so far that engages listening as a practice. And because we're dealing with ideas around mental health, psychologists, psychologies, lang um, language, and learning, actually, in terms of the answer to the question about teaching, um, is that listening just takes the time it takes. And I think that's a really important aspect of what I'm recognising in watching all of the other presentations, um, including the silent, silentish presentation that Florence and Eve did before. Tea. <laughs> so we've got a, a fifteen-minute break. 
I think we, was, it, it's just been scaled down to 10, so that, talking about speed, that was the five minutes right there, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes.